Good afternoon, welcome to another AP US History video with Mr. Pate. Today our topic is looking at the first part of the age of Jackson, mainly focusing on the tariff issue, but also looking at Indian removal. Our essential questions for today. First, why was the South so angered by the tariff of 1828? And second, how did the tariff crisis foreshadow the Civil War? Let's go. All right, the tariff crisis. Essentially, the tariff of 1828 is going to raise the tariff rate from 24% to 45% now. I'd probably better back up for just a minute. Let's look at the map. The Northeast is going to benefit from the tariff. And the South, being a one, you know, a single crop cotton economy largely, is going to not benefit. Why are they not going to benefit? Because they sell their cotton for money and they have to buy everything else. And with a tariff, it makes foreign goods coming in. It's a tax on imported goods. It makes them more expensive. It protects the northern manufactured goods, allows them to charge more for them, face competition that's not as fierce. And so basically the translation is it's going to make things more expensive if you're a farmer and you have to buy everything else. So farmers are never going to like the tariffs too much. But think about this. This tariff is almost doubling the tariff. So the price is going from about a quarter markup to almost a half markup uh, on every dollar. That is extreme. This, the North likes it because they're saying this is going to make us super competitive and help us to dominate uh, in you know manufacturing sales. But you can see why the, the South would be very angry about it. So, the, and one of the things that's important to note is Jackson and Calhoun, the Vice President Calhoun with Jackson, when they were running against uh, John Quincy Adams in 1828, they hatched this tariff thinking it'll trap Quincy Adams, that he'll never vote for it, then he'll alienate New England, he already has alienated the South and the West, and the election will be a shoe in This comes back to bite them hard. It's a big problem because, to their surprise, Quincy Adams signs it, keeping the support of New England, but further alienating and ensuring his defeat with the rest of the country. Well, then they get into office, and John Calhoun, the vice president, is going to secretly and anonymously pin the South Carolina Exposition and Protest. The South Carolina Exposition and Protest is going to harken back to this idea of nullification. Nullification, coming back from the Virginia and Kentucky Resolution, said that states could nullify a law that they believed was unconstitutional. Now, where would they get such an idea that they could do that? It comes from something called the Compact Theory. If we look back at the Declaration of Independence, it has the little tiny written United States where, excuse me, the United is small and it is lowercase, and then you have capitalized states that's written much larger at the top in the title. You can find this anywhere online if you're interested in seeing it. Well, this is basically an idea that the states created the Union, they created the Constitution, so they could then... Uh, declare something unconstitutional. And this, of course, comes about with the Alien and Sedition Acts. That's when the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions emerge. Well, 30 years later, it's back. Okay? And so what we're going to see is South Carolina is taking these steps to try and stop this. Now, this is not stupidity on Calhoun's part. He sees on the horizon the possibility that slavery could be abolished someday. Okay? So we've already kind of answered essential question one. They hate this tariff because they are going to have to pay a lot more money and they're very dependent on imported goods and manufactured goods as they do not produce them themselves. But now we're getting into why is this foreshadowing the Civil War? Well essentially nullification, it, he's using the tariff issue as a test case to lay the groundwork for a return by a return by uh, you know to this type of a concept with the slavery issue later on. If, in the future, slavery was found by the federal government to be you know, unconstitutional or abolished or outlawed or whatever you want to say, they would have laid the groundwork with nullification to say, okay, we're out, we leave. Well, this issue continues to bubble up and cause problems. Um, Hayne and Webster have a debate that actually starts with something else, but then Robert Hayne, the protege of John Calhoun from South Carolina, he's going to come in and hammer the, the North and basically say North is selfish, the tariff only benefits it, and all they care about is themselves, and we think this thing's terrible, and basically just says the North has been disloyal with the Hartford Convention and traitorous and is awful, and it basically just hammers them. The response is going to be made by New England native son, Daniel Webster, who's going to defend the idea of union and say, 
We have this great experiment, and the union must be preserved. The idea of the union, that people willingly, and the, the states have willingly all come together, that this is something that we have to care for, we have to protect. And he says, we also want to be fair. The union does things in the best interest of everybody, not just one section, not just looking out for yourselves, but for everyone. There's give and take. Both of these arguments are going to crystallize and be used as motivations later on with the Civil War. Okay, this leads us to the Jefferson Day Dinner, also in 1830. And the Jefferson Day Dinner, you have some toasts. So you have Robert Hayne is going to say, the union of the states, the sovereignty of the states. Now you know probably what a toast looks like at a wedding, at a wedding uh, you know, reception. So he gets up and toasts this, the union of the states, the sovereignty of the states. Ah, back to the compact theory. Okay, Jackson, who Hayne and Calhoun are attempting to trick into supporting states' rights in a public statement at this dinner commemorating what Jefferson had meant to their party and to who they were, as political, politically speaking. Jackson, however, gets very angry, knows what they're up to, and gets up and he toasts and says, our union, the federal union, it must be preserved. Okay, Calhoun then gets up and says, our union, next to our liberty, the most dear. Hmm. Everyone else is pretty much silent, and it is an ugly situation. All right, well, this all culminates with the Eaton Affair, where one of Cal uh, Jackson's friends, John Eaton, marries a woman named Peggy. So Peggy e Eaton is this woman, and John Eaton is in the cabinet. He used to be the fellow senator of Jackson's in Tennessee. And he, his wife, Peggy Eaton, has a few things in her past that are a little bit scandalous. She's going to be uh, gossiped about, given the cold shoulder to, ripped by all of the Washington wives. This is going to enrage Jackson. Why? Because his own wife, Rachel, died from illnesses after falling into what you would call today a clinical depression after all of the brutal and harsh attacks that she under uh, it, she suffered from in the election of 1828. Anti-Jackson people just ripped her to shreds. Well, Jackson never forgave those who attacked him and blamed them for the death of his beloved Rachel. Well, with all that happening, Jackson's a widower, and now he sees his good friend's wife suffering from the same fate. So he's going to demand that these guys control their wives stop them from ripping her, and that they welcome and embrace Peggy Eaton. They do not. They do not change. Eventually, this is significant enough. I know it sounds like a soap opera kind of, but this matters because Jackson is going to basically kick out of his cabinet and out of his government these guys whose wives rip Peggy Eaton, including, this is the final straw, with John Calhoun, who now Jackson knows had done the South Carolina Exposition of Protest. He's Haynes' buddy. He stood him up and ripped, embarrassed him at the Jefferson Day dinner. So he's like, you're out of here. And he's going to replace him. Now, who does he replace him with? Martin Van Buren, a widower himself who has does not have one of these wives doing this. So this reshapes who becomes vice president in the next election of 1832 and then who becomes the next president because Van Buren will win chiefly because Jackson's popular and he's his... VP. These things all contribute to this idea of sectionalism. The idea of, you know, think about the War of 1812. There's this afterglow and everyone's patriotic and we're all Americans. Well, here we are and it's, you know, less than 20 years later, really a little more than 15 years later, and now we're back to this idea of sectionalism. And the South is saying what's good for us and you're bad in the North and the North's saying what's good for us is good for everyone and you've got this argument developing. Well, ultimately, South Carolina, um, there is a compromise tariff in 1832, but it barely lowers the tariff amount. So South Carolina says, we're out. This is enough. They declared an ordinance of nullification. Not saying they would secede, like they were laying the groundwork to do on a future issue with slavery, but saying we refuse to collect this tariff in South Carolina because it's a bad tariff. All right. Well, Jackson is going to respond by getting Congress to pass the force bill, which means he can call in the army and force South Carolina to support this. Now, South Carolina is hoping other southern states will come to its defense, but they're all like, um, yeah, you're on your own. So the force bill gets passed, 
But at the same time, Henry Clay, Mr. Compromise, okay, he is going to get his second big compromise, the Compromise Tariff of 1833 passed, which is going to uh, gradually lower this tariff down over 10 years so it would go down almost as low as it had started. And thus the tariff issue ends. But real big storm clouds that have emerged here as far as everything related to um, future problems with slavery. Okay, so we move on to our second topic, Indian removal. The Cherokee Nation, um, Cherokee Nation, they sometimes owned slaves. They had passed a constitution modeled largely on the U.S. Constitution. They're one of what was called the Five Civilized Tribes. They were making efforts to fit in and be assimilated. And they weren't taking over this, they weren't in control of this huge area, but they were kind of throughout this southeastern, northern Florida, Georgia, Alabama area. And so I just kind of marked it in over here so you can see it. They want to fit in. They declare themselves an independent nation within these states. Georgia is going to say, no, you're not. And in the court case, Cherokee Nation v. Georgia, the court sides with Georgia and says, you're not an independent nation and you don't even have standing to bring a case to court. But then someone else is going to bring a case on their behalf because Georgia wants to sell off all their land and kick them out. And basically they are going to win this, that they have a right to stay on their land. Okay? So the, the Cherokee win this second court case in 1832. However, the Indian Removal Act is going to be passed and Jackson, someone who his previous experiences really colored his future views and actions. One of the, we'll see more of this on the next video when we talk about the bank, but one of the ways we see this is the Trail of Tears. He is going to say, nope, I, you know, remember Jackson fought against, uh, down in Florida around the War of 1812 against the Creek Indians, and he just believes that they're savages and that they could never integrate and assimilate into U.S. society. So he says, nope, we're going to move you. Now this area over here they thought was called the Great American Desert at the time. So he's actually going to move them on to today's Oklahoma. And that is all the time we have for today. Looking at the tariff issue and looking at Indian removal. Stay classy.